Okie dokie, class is in session. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, spending your time, especially the last talk uh, of the day here. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll wander down one of the many paths and uh, share an experience together um, of what my mind can do against everything around us. But uh, uh, in, in the vein of that kind of a crappy opener, um, does that show up okay-ish? Uh, whatever. No. no. All righty. <laughs> yeah, everything else. Uh, so my name's Russ Handorf. Um, I've been around in this plane of existence for quite some time. Uh, my contact information uh, is uh, russell at handorf.com or .org. Uh, and my Twitter handle is uh, don't look behind you. I volunteer extensively in the wireless village. So if you see me around at uh, conferences, that's typically where you would have uh, found me where I run uh, and design some of the software defined radio challenges uh, when they work. And um, other than that, uh, from those life experiences, I try to move them over into other practical components um, of exploring new technology and new directions and things that are a little bit wonky. And uh, this is exactly uh, one of those moments where things get a little bit wonky for me. So I've uh, recently finished uh, defending my PhD, huzzah. So if anyone ever wants to play doctor, I'm qualified. Um, but one of the big problems that I had while I was going through that was uh, that little kind of attention deficit squirrel moment where there would be these random projects or random ideas that just show up out of nowhere that drove me away from what I was exactly supposed to be working on. And this uh, turned into one of them. So over the last year, um, I'm, I've got about 80% of my computer rebuilt uh, from scratch. I built a PDP-8 out of a Raspberry Pi. That's done. Uh, you know, I, I got about an acre of land. I got about 80% of an irrigation in system installed myself. That was awful. Uh, I'm never done with a wireless village. Just can't quit z uh, zero. Uh, this talk is about one of those uh, uh, tangents, uh, which was building an atomic clock at home uh, as poorly and quickly as possible. And then there's another project which uh, I call. Uh, I gave a talk on last year called Soho Sigint where I'm collecting signals of interest around my house and using um, pattern matching to identify people. Well, tell me when a friend has shown up at my house or not versus the postman or uh, someone who's going to proselytize or prostitute or whatever anyways. Um, so I, I can gauge the level of nakedness that I'm going to answer the door in. Um, but regarding Soho Sigint, personal tangent, uh, thanks to Dragorn, uh, I think he's uh, put around in that project with his new revamped version of Kismet because it now does everything Soho Sigint uh, was starting to do. So tip of the hat to him for uh, doing that. But anything else uh, uh, that kept me from having to write my dissertation was fantastic. And I do have a daughter. Uh, she was a distraction in that as well, but that's that's a responsibility. I just can't leave her on her own. I can just pick up a soldering iron and go to town on something else. That's my own self-detriment uh, uh, towards uh, finishing that. Well, finally I'm done, so I have a void of time to fill. Uh, future projects are uh, experiments with geophones and things along those lines, but whatever. Uh, security haunts us by day. You got to have something by night that uh, uh, helps you rebalance yourself. Well, in this particular project, I managed to wrap in one of my friends, uh, John Crino, who likes to uh, explore these wild random ventures every once in a while. Together we've made uh, musical Tesla coils, uh, Nixie, you name it, clocks, caller ID uh, displays, all that sort of random stuff, uh, plasma speakers, um, just re really I think a submission is uh, to see how long I could leave a project on the kitchen table unfinished to see how quickly my wife gets pissed off. Um, but he, he joins me in these ventures and uh, building uh, an atomic clock uh, at home was uh, one of the ones that interested him. So uh, rubidium oscillators 101. Uh, this slide pretty much describes exactly uh, at a high level the mechanics of how they work. So in the, uh, you have this thing that is beautifully named the physics package. And inside that physics package, you have a chamber that has uh, one isotope of rubidium uh, that's been uh, gasified. And then you have a uh, rubidium lamp that's another isotope and 
of that same uh, isotope of the lamp is a, a light detector. And when you get your physics package excited uh, and the uh, rubidium starts gyrating uh, to the tempo of a very specific temperature, uh, it oscillates. And it oscillates very, very controlled in a very, very predictable, uh, predictable manner, whereas to the point where if you use it as a time source, uh, the error in seconds is measured in uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, it's not a cesium clock, which costs a whole lot more to build and requires a lot more equipment and adds zeros to the, uh, uh, the end of the uh, cost for the build for you to do it at home. Um, and is also not accurate, as accurate, and this, well, sorry, it's far more accurate than a rubidium one, but I'm going to be long dead, and this junk is going to be something for my kids to have to handle anyways. So uh, 100,000 years is good enough uh, for government work. So the, the easiest, fastest way uh, to do this is uh, to purchase this device. It's called a uh, FE568OA. Uh, and uh, they come, if you're going to take this particular route, uh, I'm going to give you some warnings about this. Uh, they, are, they all have the exact same model number. Uh, there are no other distinguishing characteristics from something that you can search. But they are all very different from each other. Well, not all of them are very different from each other. There's families of them that are very different from each other. Uh, some of them may only output a pulse per second. Some of them may be calibrated for a 10 megahertz sine wave and nothing else. Some may have any combination of those fine features of being able to set the frequency that it's going to oscillate at uh, on its way out, or be a, a PPS uh, generator, or anything along those lines. And in addition to that, it may have different interfaces on it as well. So in the leftmost image, you can see that there's a DB9 connector on it, but in the right image, uh, there's some SMA connectors off the back. Uh, so depending, uh, if you're going to go out and purchase one of these, uh, pay very, very close attention uh, to what it looks like and what the uh, specified description is about it. And you can buy them off of eBay uh, without any problem. And uh, what you are ideally looking for off of the ones on eBay are ones that give you a pulse per second out, one that uh, also gives you a 10 megahertz signal out, uh, sine wave, uh, and then uh, even more ideally, one that has serial input output on it. That way you can uh, do minute calibration uh, on the uh, rubidium oscillator itself. Um, this picture on the right that has everything outlined, uh, you look for anything that has descriptions for pins one, two, four, three, and seven. And if you see those, you are golden. Um, on uh, having uh, purchased that particular oscillator. So uh, what does that physics package and what does this mystery device look like on the inside? Well, once you open it up, you have some discrete electronics, but you can see that there's two pieces, uh, well, there's one piece of yellow at the top, which is uh, soft foam. That's actually uh, a really crappy um, uh, thermal isolation from the actual physics package, which is underneath that like expandable foam that you would use for insulation. That is the thing that you absolutely have to make sure uh, keeps warm and all that sort of stuff. But if it gets too hot, it can create error uh, in one of the other sub oscillators and the um, other uh, component on the board. Now on the other ones, if they don't have the PPS uh, output or anything along those lines, uh, when you do open them up, uh, you can see that there's that blue wire that comes down to a uh, UML connector on the uh, motherboard. Uh, sometimes you can just do that yourself and save yourself the headache. Or you could open it up and uh, follow the traces very, very, uh, they're wonderfully labeled. Uh, but you could follow the traces to directly connect to the uh, data out, signal out, or uh, serial out off of the, um, uh, the box, uh, out of the uh, box itself. Um, now, the thing that's, uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself, but I'll go ahead and explain it real quick. Uh, these things, actually, and I'll go back to this slide to explain that part. Where these come from typically are recycled cell phone tower uh, transmission sites. Uh, they get sent over to China, dismantled, and then they somehow show up on eBay and then ship back into the US. Um, uh, somehow that South Park episode of jewelry moving around the world kind of comes back in my head, uh, but this time regarding electronics. Uh, these are typically used 
to uh, provide the signal and clock sourcing for TDMA and CDMA based towers. Uh, they're also in GSM as well, but um, that is what their actual commercial use is for. Uh, there are military uses for these as well. Uh, you can kind of guess what might require uh, precision guidance, controls, directions that can be disposable. Uh, so you don't want to lose something that costs a couple hundred to uh, low millions of dollars. If it's a one and done sort of thing, a couple hundred bucks is disposable. So that, that's another use out of these things. Well, the, uh, uh, but what's more interesting to me is like going, uh, it's not so much the electronics piece, it's like learning how these suckers work. And inside of them, inside that physics package, when you cut off the uh, uh, gold container, uh, this is exactly from that previous overall diagram I showed you what is inside. On the top there, you have the photo detector. In the middle, you got your gas chamber. And if you can see it all right, there's a little bead of erbidium uh, inside of there that's nice and cool. Uh, so when it heats up, it's going to gasify. And, uh, and the bottom is the, uh, uh, the lamp. So that's, that's what it looks like on the inside. Um, Yes. Is this an appropriate timer for like GPS or variants in other countries? Uh, they typically use cesium based oscillators. However, you can, uh, I'm going to show you a comparison between this and GPS in a minute. Um, because uh, NTP made the decision for me. Um, so my initial build objective was to um, sarcastically be able to answer the question from my wife, do you know what time it is? Um, or at least that's one of the mo sub-motivating goals was. But more importantly, it's, it's, I, I just kind of like to have one of these things in the house. And once I understood how to make it work, uh, build another one and be able to uh, like possibly do some very simple time experiments and demonstrations uh, with my kid. Like you can leave one at ho uh, home and then take the other one with you to the mountains for a long weekend and then come back and you show the time is different uh, between the two because the effect of gravity on the uh, uh, rubidium oscillator. Uh, which is a very me uh, measurable thing to be able to uh, demonstrate. Um, and then for anyone who's ever seen uh, the madness at my house, I also wanted to make this uh, fit inside the rack and then have the uh, rest of my other components uh, pull off of it. So um, I ordered one, uh, one late one night, and uh, it took a while to get through customs. and. Um, uh, the reason why it took a while was because of the rubidium piece of it, uh, but it eventually made it through. And it was labeled as amateur radio parts. And uh, the reason for that is a lot of amateur radio operators like to use these things, well, like quotations, uh, to use these things primarily because of the, um, um, the use of the, times, uh, the 10 megahertz uh, sine wave frequency that comes out of it for gigahertz uh, communication. So anything that's like 12 gigahertz and high, oh sorry, 1.2 gigahertz and higher, you really need to have a good TCO, uh, TCXO uh, in order to drive uh, that, uh, to be the oscillator to drive that radio. These are really good uh, cheap solutions for that. Well, I mentioned on uh, one of the previous slides, you have two voltage inputs. Uh, one is a 5 volt and the other one's like a 17 to 19 volt input. Uh, well, the folks who mailed this over were kind enough to also send a free power 5 volt regulator uh, with it that you just solder yourself, um, which is just that one chip that's there. Um, and then they also gave like this little stuffed bear thing. Anyways, um, I, I'm not sure if it fell in the box by accident in the, uh, uh, the packing mine or not. This is how mine showed up, and it was fantastic. It had everything that I needed. It had a chopped um, DB9 connector on it, which was great. Uh, it had nice foam padding on the side, which told me it was handled with tender, loving care when it was removed. Uh, and they were kind enough to uh, uh, throw in like a really inexpensive uh, five uh, volt regulator. I mean, these things are like a few cents, but it's the thought that counts. Well, I mentioned that Crino, uh, my friend, um, uh, went on this adventure as well, and he bought one from the exact same supplier. His did not show up as uh, in uh, such good condition. Uh, if you can see in the lower right hand image, um, it looks like they, uh, there's uh, grommets and rivets that they use to uh, put it onto a heat sink plate. Uh, and they just like cut them off angrily. And uh, 
he, uh, he contacted the uh, eBay uh, seller and then they sent him another one for free. Nice on them. We got this one working again, so we got two for one. Um, so uh, essentially, I, I just wanted to see what would happen if, you know, let's just go ahead and solder it up, plug it in, turn it on, fingers crossed, let's see if it works. And the, uh, the things you got to watch out for is that you got your two different voltages, so you got to apply the right ones to the right pins, otherwise you're going to have a sad panda mo uh, moment. Uh, there is a pin that is high that goes to low uh, when the physics package is able to receive uh, or sense that the 10 megahertz frequency is stable. Because uh, what it's doing is, is it's constantly watching itself, uh, that uh, sine wave, and if it's more than 10 megahertz, it's starting to cool itself off, and if it's less than 10 megahertz, it's starting to warm itself back up. So once it's uh, exactly at 10 megahertz, it tries its best to keep the temperature under control, and it goes, hey, I'm locked onto a good signal source, life is peachy, and then once lock is achieved, uh, the pulse per second pen starts firing out a pulse uh, once every second. So. Uh, I was ecstatic to see that I didn't release the purple smoke. There were no funny smells. I got a fantastic perfect 10 megahertz uh, uh, signal out of it. Uh, the, pen, uh, the lock pen went low uh, and it totally worked as advertised out of the box. This was going to be easy, or so I thought. Um, but that was the good news. Um, and uh, uh, what I did notice out of it was a few other things. This sucker gets hot. Uh, the temperature on that meat thermometer uh, says it's uh, just below 110 degrees. Uh, I took that picture when it didn't receive lock yet, so it gets a lot hotter. Uh, I measured it uh, at 180 degrees uh, when it got lock, uh, when it locked onto the 10 megahertz uh, frequency. Um, and uh, regarding that, I, I was kind of curious of can I prove uh, even further that uh, the temperature heating cooling mechanism is working correctly by forcing it to go in and out of lock by you know just dropping a heat sink on it and then secondarily to that knowing that there's some discrete electronics on the inside that are really really sensitive uh, to the amount of heat that this uh, oven can generate inside of it um, is there something I could do to control that because this thing is mounted typically on a giant sheet of metal and that's its way to convect the heat off the excess heat so uh, I just went through the parts bin, found a low profile 1U uh, uh, heat sink with a fan, plopped it on it uh, within like a few seconds it went out of lock and then I just found it, uh, moved it to a good spot where it then went back into lock. But now the average temperature of the whole package externally to the touch is about 100 degrees. I can live with this now. I burned my house down. Uh, so the uh, next part of the experiment was, all right, I, I now have a working physics package. I like saying that. And uh, my next thought was, all right, well, I've got this pen that's one pulse per second. I should just be able to, you know, throw some bubble, goo, uh, bubble gum and goo and gum and hope and dreams directly to the GPIO pen of a Raspberry Pi and start counting, the, uh, receiving that pulse per second and life will be great. And um, uh, that was definitely not the case. So the, uh, uh, before you connect anything up, you always got to measure uh, what you're seeing and what you're receiving. So I measured uh, what my pulse per second looked like out of this thing. And the characteristics were is that uh, the pulse was one microsecond in length. So that's really, 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 really quick. Uh, it typically uh, peaked out at about five volts uh, for its pulse per second, which is fairly high. Um, and then the, uh, I took a look at the specs of what the Raspberry Pi can detect, uh, can detect on its GPIO pins. And typically, uh, it wants a signal uh, to last, uh, it's kind of like a, a, imagine a bell ringing if it goes tink it might not hear it, but if it goes gong and just rings out a whole lot longer, there's a higher chance or a higher probability that the Pi is going to pick that signal up uh, when its internal clock goes through and goes, hey, what's the status of me? Who that tickles. And I registered a tickle, and so the pen must have uh, received a pulse. The other last part was the Raspberry Pi will only take uh, on its data pens a max voltage of three volts. So uh, I was frustrated. This was not going to be as easy as like take this thing and plug it in there and life was going to be great. So I amended my build objective list. 
uh, to uh, not cook my raspberry pi um, so that was um, uh, injected directly as a new thing but I needed something to compare it against so I had another GPS that did uh, work directly off the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi uh, it had a 3 volt uh, max and it also did a PPS output so I uh, uh, did a quick comparison between uh, what my rubidium clock was generating and what a GPS generates so the GPS is the image on the right uh, you recognize the one from the rubidium oscillator on the left and if you can't read uh, the values at the bottom, each interval here is one microsecond, each interval here is 100 milli uh, milliseconds. So significantly longer. Um, but it was exactly at 3 volts DC. Uh, it proved my theory of like it needed to be about 100 milliseconds in length. And, uh, but also at the same time, I also, looking at it, I was like, well, it, my previous one was a nice little as square wave as you can get for a pulse. Uh, this thing um, isn't. Uh, so that tells me that the Raspberry Pi isn't picky enough about that for its signal in uh, for the GPIO pins. I was like, all right, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Fine, I can live with this. This is going to make that part at least hopefully easier. So. Uh, leave it to a blonde uh, to turn a DC signal back into an AC signal for a pulse per second. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, what, what was happening was uh, the pulse uh, would hit the diode and the diode would resonate up and down, up and down, and then slowly get quieter. But the good news was is that I saw that the diode was uh, uh, increasing the length of that resonation. Uh, so I was like, okay, I was able to draw out that that pulse uh, to an acceptable window. But damn it, I now have an AC signal. This isn't cool. And um, I was, uh, uh, the other thing that I noticed uh, eventually uh, after I fixed that part of the problem was uh, the Raspberry Pi was now able to detect the PPS, but it was picking it up uh, on these time intervals like way, way, way too quickly. So time intervals were in uh, milliseconds of each other. Uh, so it would, and then it would uh, over and over and over. So anyone who works with radio, what do you think I was getting? Hmm? What happens if you have too much power transmitting down a line and it hits the end of that line? remember then that you had to put a terminator at the end of it in order to keep reflections from coming back so in short, I was picking reflections uh, for the pulse per second so huzzah I didn't cook the pie it was picking the signal but it was picking it up too much so uh, um, uh, this is the other uh, hint as to uh, uh, the solution that I ended up doing to find a really uh, off of the Pi and not off of the uh, rubidium oscillator itself. Their ground references go through not directly to the ground pins all the time through the GPIO uh, bus. So in short, <coughs> when I connected all this up, I actually had to throw the ground reference directly back to the power supply that was powering the entire kit as opposed to being lazy about it and saying, oh, ground is ground. I could just pull it off of the uh, Pi or pull it off of the uh, oscillator. Nope, not in this case. I had to actually just pull it directly off of the, uh, um, the power supply itself. So now I have that nice pulse within the right voltage and it's extended uh, into the window uh, where things were hunky-dory peachy keen. Um, uh, instead of seeing like that massive reflection, I, uh, it would pick the signal up twice. So I still had a bit of a reflection issue. Uh, I got lazy and just threw a trim pot on to fix that. Uh, so uh, once I did that, I was able to, uh, so the reflection would go down, it would come back and then hit back down to the Pi. That second one was a weaker one and the, uh, uh, I used a Zener diode to just throw anything below uh, that voltage level directly to ground. Life was peachy. So all of a sudden now, I am now getting pulse per second uh, and the Raspberry Pi is picking it up. I let it run for weeks on end. Uh, I didn't get any blue or purple smoke. Uh, the GPIO bus on the Pi didn't fry. I didn't have to move to another pen for like whacking it over and over again. Because if you want to think about it in some regards, uh, 
don't do this, but if you were to turn to the person next to you and just thump them once every second, it gets a little irritating. And the way the GPIO bus on uh, the Pies are uh, engineered in some way is that a uh, strong thump, it, they'll actually, I, I parallel it to like getting bruised. Uh, the electronics wear out uh, from it. So this was still within the tolerances of it and everything was fine. So I had an intermission at this particular point in time. Uh, I lost about three weeks of uh, focus for this project due to work, travel, kids, uh, thinking, uh, thinking about actually writing on my PhD, which I didn't. Um, but the, uh, uh, I was still kind of like in the back of my head. Uh, I got it to extend a, a close to 100 milliseconds, but not exactly there, and I was still worried that that was going to be a problem. So I threw uh, a tweet out and asked uh, for some help, uh, and some friends responded. Uh, there's a guy named Tim uh, uh, who uh, uh, has been a player in our wireless village. Uh, he's the guy who's rocked the dog uh, shock collar uh, challenge. Anyone who wants to play that, fair game. And then uh, there are some other folks uh, that have uh, worked in this space that responded back to me, like uh, Rob from Nuon and uh, Dragorn, guy who wrote Kismet. And they, they gave me some uh, suggestions of some other stuff. Like one of them was to use a 555 timer in order to try to get the PPS from the oscillator to trigger the 555 for it to then in turn flip the light switch on for a time interval and then turn it off. So I tried a variety of these things and um, they worked, but uh, when I started having to rely on other uh, components in order to do that time delay, uh, the ultimate measure for this was, well, I might be ringing a buzzer or having something else ringing the buzzer for me, but what does NTP think, uh, the actual application NTP think of these sources? So I slung it together. I got NTP uh, to receive the PPS and compare it against uh, what the GPS was giving it. Uh, so uh, without um, the, uh, uh, the oscillator, the Raspberry Pi's internal clock jitter was worse than the GPS's, but the GPS's uh, jitter was at uh, 15 uh, microseconds. Um, with the um, uh, rubidium oscillator, uh, the pulse per second was 0 0.001 microseconds uh, for jitter. So that tell uh, if NTP goes, yes, this thing is stable and awesome, then that meant that I now had the functions of an atomic clock. Uh, using a Raspberry Pi and this external oscillator. So the other thing that was interesting was uh, later in life um, uh, getting the uh, boot up process to behave correctly. And uh, uh, it turns out that GPS isn't also always the most reliable source for getting um, a pulse per second because weather phenomena can delay it. Uh, your GPS receiver uh, has uh, firmware in it that tries to account for that error. So that's like a band-aid to a broader uh, problem that I experienced uh, solely because of being able to compare it against uh, this other source. Well, next uh, thing was uh, hearing from Carino and how he was doing with his. Um, uh, he had a very similar success in stabilizing uh, the pulse per second. Uh, getting his Pi to input it. Uh, we, we worked in isolation but slightly pinged each other uh, solely because we wanted to see what the other solutions uh, were possible uh, and all that sort of stuff. So we compared notes and it turns out that we were very, very close to the exact same solution from a uh, circuit standpoint, uh, but software-wise we were exactly the same and we both had NTP um, uh, pick up on things wonderfully. So where, uh, for me personally, like I, I don't, I, I made a kernel hack in order to uh, fudge some of the RasPi's detection of the PPS. I don't really like doing that. Ideally, I'd like to use some sort of um, uh, circuit to reliably trigger that for me. The ones listed there are ones that I've built and tested, um, minus the, I still haven't done the uh, multi-vibrator yet. Uh, where's RenderMan when you need him? Um, but the, uh, the other component of it is, is I have an external as to like, do I have um, a 10 megahertz signal or not? 
Ideally, I want to use the MB506 internally already on the same board that I'm building for this. And then the last fa uh, stage is to just cram it all in one URAC case. Um, and ultimately, like uh, just a little bit before this presentation, I was like, you know what? Let's make another Internet of Things thing. And uh, just quickly hack together uh, something that gives me like a status. What it uses GPS for is to go, what time is it mostly? Oh, it's 1231. All right, pulse per second directly after 1231. And then every once in a while it queries uh, GPSD again in order to see, uh, does my 1231 still match yours? Um, and when I was solely relying on GPSD uh, being the time source for it, uh, the NTP would get angry and start saying your GPS is not precise enough for me to use it as a stratum zero or stratum one time source. Uh, it wanted to use GPS as stratum two or stratum one, but stratum two preferably because of the amount of jitter uh, that it was picking up uh, in association with it. So I just quickly threw together something that um, would visibly render the status of the appliance. Yes, sir? Uh, it was about a $180 GPS from Garmin. Um, so it's the, the, no, 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 it was, uh, uh, it may have had, uh, mostly due to, uh, maybe noise from the cable, uh, cause it was a serial device, uh, as opposed to USB and passing data that way. Um, but there was something specifically about it that it just didn't like that I could replicate on another device as well. Um. May have dropped it one too many times. Yes, sir. Rabetti oscillator. On eBay, you can find them anywhere between eighty dollars to two hundred dollars, uh, and it's mostly because uh, some people don't realize what they have and what they're selling. Uh, so you may get lucky with that. That's the eighty dollar end of the spectrum. The ones that really go, yeah, I know what I got, and it's actually interesting. They'll sell them for about two hundred bucks. When you buy them brand new, uh, they can be a little under a thousand bucks. I've seen the manufacturer who sells them. I've seen them uh, with the variety of uh, features that they have under the exact same part number. It starts from like five hundred bucks and goes up to about a thousand bucks. And these these are the devices that are and the cell phone towers that are allowing multiple customers to share the same frequency because uh, of TDMA or CDMA. Hey, it, it, I think the T in TDMA means what? Uh, anyways, so it's fairly important uh, for those sort of functions. And uh, this is just a fun little reuse of something else that's out there. Now, the other, uh, while researching this thing, I should also note that there are some other videos uh, and other people that have played with this device, but it's kind of, I, the way I describe some of the write-ups is like these people bought this thing in the mail and they just wanted the lazy plug it in, turn it on and everything works and then they wrote a skating, ranting, table flipping review uh, of the device that they got without actually trying to understand what it was or how it worked. And so, so that's, that information is on the end of the spectrum of the people that don't like it. Uh, and then on the end of the spectrum are like some of the ham radio operators that have taken this to use in contests for uh, gigahertz radio links. And it's good enough for that, uh, where they're able to um, uh, have multiple transmitters operating right next to each other without them stepping on each other with this cheap little $80 oscillator. Uh, I've seen other people use them in their workbenches uh, for radio experiments. Um, and uh, there's this one guy who's actually made this like really crazy steampunk style atomic clock that screams at you what the time is. Um, that looks, it really looks steampunkish, but his works just fine and it's really, really neat looking. But he enjoyed uh, playing with this device. Um, my personal opinion of reviewing some of this stuff is that people just weren't really sinking their teeth in to understand what they got. Uh, uh, they got a little bit lazy with some of the uh, or write-ups or even their own research on it. Um, it isn't the that's out there, but it works well enough uh, to be able to do this other stuff if you can figure out a band-aid to apply to it if you need to. And uh, I, like I said, they may be 
they are used uh, when you're getting them off of eBay, so your mileage may vary from it, but don't give up or uh, be frustrated with it. The sellers will try to work with you in order to get that favorable you know, five out of five star review. But uh, you can repair them, you can experiment, and that's ultimately all. So now that I got this thing at home and I'm starting to do time sync in my house, my, my ultimate goal is to no longer have the mismatched uh, time settings on devices uh, or the microwave and the oven and my cell phone have like wildly different times uh, set on them. Um, but you know, uh, the, uh, well I have, I have a regular oven with a clock on it as well, but uh, you know that for those devices since they don't take an external time source, um, I might be putting additional warranty in the near future. Um, so. At this point, I can show you uh, through a uh, interesting rendering of the web page of what the current status of the system is. Otherwise, I'll uh, uh, take questions if anyone has them uh, at the moment. Yes, sir. So first, to comment on your uh, your uh, outside projects while doing your PhD, I know it was <laughs> and her husband was a PhD chemist, and uh, he took about five years, and he took a year off and went bowling. Yeah. You, you, you got to take time I'm off. Yeah. That comment aside, actually, uh, the real timekeepers use hydrogen lasers now. Yes. Yeah. I did see that on. Unless you get them from Russia. So now you can actually, if you're careful and you know what you're looking for, you can actually pick up cesium clocks for several hundred dollars if you know the right jump shot. Yeah. And so it's, it's a little bit lucky on that. So it's not as simple as. Yeah, th this is as close as easy sort of thing that you can get. So, like, I, I threw some questions on the Time Nuts mailing list. And uh, even back from those people and digging on the history of it, you still had widely, like, some people really, really liked it and other people really, really hated it. I mean, big timekeepers, they talk in terms of 10 to the minus 15. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, what I do know is that uh, for those, I have a friend who has uh, a dozen, If he wants to get rid of one, I'll, I'll be happy. Well, <laughs> these were, he's, he forms the third of the time of a particular country, mm -hmm. even though he's a private individual. And so one of the things that will help you, even though you can't measure it, yes. is if you'll take your package, your box, and put it in an environment where it stays within a half degree C, yes. that will make its stability a lot better. Absolutely. Not a laser, but... Yeah, no, no, the, the term, uh, since... The way the device, you're absolutely right, because of the way the device functions is based upon an oven that controls the vibrations of the rubidium inside of it. No, temperature stability is absolutely key. Um, These, when my friend's clocks are all inside of a portion of his lab with a big glass wall yeah. and a bunch of custom air conditioners and heaters that keep the temperature within half degree. Oh, yeah, no, like I, I have an air conditioned server room that's on its own spot. I've got that. I've got that covered as well. I've got that covered as well. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is one individual in this room that has seen the wonkiness of uh, the Handorf household of insanity. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, that might turn into another talk of uh, the rabbit hole sort of situation. Yes, sir. These devices are are forgivable, um, so that, that's why like they're uh, they are nowhere near as accurate as like a cesium clock, uh, but they are still accurate enough to within a second of error within a, a couple hundred thousand years. Uh, so if you go with like a cesium clock, you're going to be adding some zeros uh, to the end of that hundred thousand years, um, a lot of zeros. Uh, so regarding the temperature sensitivity of it, um, the the operational range for it is uh, for the oven. If I remember correctly, it's somewhere between uh, 185 to 190 degrees is where it ideally wants to be within. So that five degree temperature drift is more like way overly forgiving uh, for um, an environment that is typically housing one of these devices. 
So inside, inside a cabinet for a cell phone tower, uh, they do have airflow and some refrigeration that's occurring inside of it, which controls it, but it's also on that giant skid. So based upon the uh, thermal dynamics of the way that they engineered that cabinet, they know by default they're just going to be shedding X amount of heat off into the chassis uh, so that it just runs and sits in the sun because of all the uh, thermal protection between the electronics inside and the external cabinet. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to open up and see inside a cell phone tower cabinet. Uh, thick doors, um, they look really big on the outside, but there's not a lot of electronics on the inside. And it's, uh, you have the NEMA standard for ratings of uh, boxes uh, for devices that can be put outside. I'm oversimplifying that. Uh, but they are of a standard that can uh, withstand, like, um, uh, a lot of moisture, a lot of uh, temperature, a lot of dust and grit. Yeah. So the way that those cabinets are built is that it's occupying a very small spot inside a broader space that's already air conditioned and uh, or doing a bigger amount of passive heating and cooling already. Uh, so that's another discussion that I'll have with you if you'd like. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a part of the engineering of their actual installation and use. Uh, because it's not, it's not like you took a server rack and placed it outside. There's a lot of uh, thermal protection uh, on those cabinets as they're sitting in the sun. I've opened one up and gotten cool air pouring out of it in the middle of the heat. Um, so it's they're, they're way more uh, controlled on the inside than you would imagine. Uh, so what these things are used for for the towers themselves is being able to uh, know when, how long a second is in order to support the current load uh, of the customers off of that individual tower itself. The handoff from one customer to another tower is an entirely different protocol, uh, but it doesn't matter uh, what the time pulse is between one to the next uh, when it does the handoff. It only cares about the pulse per second off of the active transmit, uh, transceivers off of that one tower itself in order to be able to squeeze more customers into narrower uh, time slots. Um, but when you hand off to another one, you're going to have a brand new negotiation and new uh, time slot mechanism uh, and new time source when you're over there as well. Uh, cell phone towers typically pull their time off of um, the T1 or T3 or DS3 lines. Uh, from the signal from there. Uh, if the internal clocks inside those towers fail on that, they also have GPS. Uh, but because uh, neither of those mechanisms are good enough for pulse per second for being able to cram like a couple hundred subscribers off of one radio. Uh, so for that, you need to have something that can give precision uh, error correction. And that's what these are used for in that in uh, instance from having worked in that industry for a period of time. <laughs> um. Cool. Any other questions, queries, posers? Yes? Uh, if you can get to step three, you've survived the blood loss. <laughs> yes? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I rant about these things on uh, my personal website every once in a while, uh, which is handorf.org. Uh, yeah, H-A-N-D-O-R-F dot O-R-G. Um, there's a, a sub component of it, handorf.org slash code, uh, has all the really weird random home projects, uh, some radio, some other stuff as well, but yeah. That, that's where you'll find my ramblings, or just email me, and I'll give you the bill of materials, and here's my schematics, and here's the uh, Gerber to send to Osh Park for them to print you a board to solder some components on. All that sort of bits of fun and joy. Yes, sir? How did I come to that conclusion? NTP, um, 
just triggering on that over and over and over and over again uh, was a symptom. And uh, essentially when I uh, uh, jammed the oscilloscope on the exact same pin, you would actually see the signal uh, boop, 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 boop. So that was in the time period of uh, one pulse having gone out and then there's multiple pulses still for that one pulse going out. And I was like, that's not supposed to be like that. There's only supposed to be one of those. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was the diagnostic process that I was getting uh, reflection. So the reason why is that I'm cheap uh, and that was the whole point of this. You can see I just used the original DB9 connection and just sloppily soldered on some extensions uh, and then just straight wires into breadboard uh, so there's like signal noise and loss out of the breadboard itself. Uh, when I got to the point where I was uh, burning PCBs for this, uh, a lot of that noise just straight up goes away because uh, you're no longer dealing with like alligator clips coming off of a lead that has maybe like um, uh, four strands out of the 24 individual of the copper just kind of braided out wonky like my hair is. Uh, so like that, that's not a good conduct, uh, conductor point. Uh, so by building the PCB I got a whole lot of the background nonsense uh, solved. Uh, but it's it's a really stupid simple circuit so far. Right now I'm trying to figure out, I've got like five of them and I'm now trying to get to the last point of going, I want to get all of these onto one board uh, as opposed to having like uh, five different mount points inside uh, the one U case. I just want it to be one thing and then nicer cabling and all that sort of stuff. Uh, currently right now the way that I'm detecting the uh, uh, the 10 megahertz signal, if I pull, if I throw the oscilloscope directly on the pin, it says 10 megahertz exactly. If I measure it off of the lead that comes off uh, to the, uh, uh, the microcontroller that is uh, doing the comparison, um, there is noise introduced there because that lead and that run of the wire is also right next to the pulse per second wire, which is also right next to some of the voltage wires. So it's uh, getting additional noise right next to it. So my ideal solution with this board is that it slides directly into the DB9 port, uh, port, but one of the traces that comes off goes to an SMA connector or some sort of radio specific cable that can then go to um, anything external on the box if it's going to be on the board with an SMA connector or anything along those lines. I haven't finished that part yet in my head, mostly because, hey, actually I probably could because I have free time. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the, uh, there is someone who has made uh, a bit of a daughter board that slides into it where you give it the 19 volts DCN and it's got breakout for serial, uh, an LED to display the high, uh, the lock state and a um, uh, two pins, uh, one for the pulse per second and one for the uh, uh, signal source. Uh, I wish they made uh, uh, made the signal source uh, an actual SMA connector or some equivalent actual RF connector. That would have made that a nicer um, uh, board itself. But I think they sell it for like 35 bucks. Um, if you, it's a very easy Google search to find. Any other questions, queries, posers? Alrighty. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, Go out and do weird stuff. Stop doing security when you go home. Do weird stuff. <laughs>